Hello, my name is Scott Schrader. I'm the President and Program Coordinator for the, for the Monroe County Civil War Roundtable in Monroe County, Bloomington, Indiana. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this presentation. Our speaker for tonight's program is Jonathan W. White. Dr. White is Associate Professor of American Studies at Christopher Newport University in Newport News, Virginia. He is the author or editor of 12 books, you heard me right, 12 books, um, including Abraham Lincoln and Treason in the Civil War and Emancipation, the Union Army and the Re-Election of Abraham Lincoln. The latter book was a finalist for both the Lincoln Prize and the Jefferson Davis Prize. It was a best book in the Civil War Monitor and the winner, winner of the Abraham Lincoln Institute's 2015 Book Prize. I will tell you, I have read all of John's books and they're fantastic. And, and, and you guys are in for a treat tonight too because he's also a fantastic speaker. I'll go on with the, with the introduction here. Um, he serves as the vice chairman of the Lincoln Forum and additionally sits on the boards of the Abraham Lincoln Association, the Abraham Lincoln Institute, the John L. Now III Center for Civil War History at the University of Virginia, as well as on the Ford's Theater Advisory Council. His most recent books, Midnight in America, Darkness, Sleep, and Dreams During the Civil War, which was selected as a best book by the Civil War Monitor, and Our Little Monitor, The Greatest Invention of the Civil War, which he co-authored with Anna Gibson Holliday, Holloway. Excuse me. This fall, he will publish To Address You as My Friend, African Americans' Letters to Abraham Lincoln with the University of North Carolina Press, and My Work Among the Freedmen, The Civil War and Reconstruction Letters of Harriet M. Buss with UVA Press. So he's now adding two more books to the, uh, the already extensive list which he's uh, managed to accomplish. So, and with that, I will turn things over to our guest to present this program, which is about um, his book that he co-authored with Anna Holloway, Our Little Monitor, The Greatest Invention of the Civil War. Welcome, John. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you for having me. Thanks to everyone for joining in. I should say that the uh, two books this fall will be books 11 and 12. So they're uh, in okay. the works, but they're not out yet. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen with you and use a PowerPoint to sort of talk about the story of the monitor. Give me one second to pull this up. There we go. And I'm going to talk about this book that I co-authored with Anna Gibson Holloway. Anna for many years worked at the Mariners Museum in Newport News, Virginia, which is a stone's throw away from where I am. If I were to look out the window behind me, I would almost be able to see the museum. And she created an institution there called the USS Monitor Center which houses the turret of the monitor and many, many, many other artifacts. And if you've never been to Newport News, you must come at some point and see the, the USS Monitor Center as well as the rest of the Mariner's Museum. It's been closed because of COVID, it'll be reopening in May. And so it's definitely worth, for people enthusiastic about the Civil War, it's definitely worth seeing. I wanna talk about, first I'll start by explaining the title of the book, Our Little Monitor, the Greatest Invention of the Civil War. I'll start with the subtitle. We called it The Greatest Invention of the Civil War because the Monitor really was an incredible innovation. And it actually had an estimated 37 patentable inventions aboard. One of the inventions that was on the Monitor was the world's first below the waterline flushing toilet. <laughs> and this is a cartoon that if you come to the Mariner's Museum, you can actually see they have a series of cartoons about how you use the facilities at different periods of naval history. And they have them all sitting in the stalls or by the urinals in the men's room. Um, and so while you're using the facilities in the museum, you can learn about the history of, of using the facilities in naval history around the world. And so one of the cartoons they have is Abraham Lincoln sitting on this below the waterline flushing toilet. Now, Lincoln did visit the Monitor in May of 1862. We know, and again in July of 1862, we know he was fascinated by the Monitor. We don't know if he used the toilet or not. That's one thing I wish we knew, we just don't. But in this cartoon, it does actually capture a real life experience that happened to the surgeon of the Monitor, a man named Daniel Logue. Daniel Logue was on board the Monitor. He needed to use the facilities. And you can get a sense from this cartoon that there were different valves that you had to turn. It didn't have a regular flusher like we're used to today. And Surgeon Logue didn't know the order that you were supposed to turn the valves. And so the poor doctor used the facilities and then turned this under 
the waterline flushing toilet into the world's first below the waterline bidet. And this cartoon captures Lincoln in that, um, in that situation. The main title of the book is Our Little Monitor. And I have pictured here a Civil War token. I'm sure most of you are familiar with these, so I won't say a whole lot about the tokens that emerged during this era. But this token circulated very widely in the North during the Civil War. So widely, in fact, that you can go on eBay at any given point and see a dozen or two available for sale. And this token, I think, captures the sense of the affection that Northerners had for the monitor. They loved the monitor. The monitor was almost uh, a personification in, in a way. It was our little monitor. And we found soldiers and civilians writing about the monitor as our little monitor. And of course, then that phrase is passing around people's hands in their pockets. And so we, we thought this would be a great title for the book. So our little monitor, the greatest invention of the Civil War. Now, I'm gonna start off by talking about things that are probably familiar to many of you who are watching in terms of a broad history of the Civil War and the Monitor's role in the first year of the war. And then I'm gonna transition to talk about some aspects of the Monitor story that you might not be as familiar with. I'm gonna wind up showing you, I think about 75 pictures. Most of these appear in the book. The book itself has 131 images. They're all in color if they were available in color at the time. Now, this one is a, is a political cartoon from 1861 called Scott's Great Snake. And this captures the plan that General Winfield Scott came up with at the beginning of the war to try to strangle the South by what was known as the Anaconda Plan. And the idea was we're going to put blockading vessels around the Confederate coastline. We're going to stop things from coming in and out of the Confederacy, and that will make it so that they're not getting the munitions that they need to fight the war. And also they won't be able to trade with the rest of the world. This was a very controversial decision because under international law at the time, it was illegal to blockade ports of your own nation. And so Lincoln in a way was actually de facto recognizing the legitimacy of secession, even though legally he would never acknowledge that. But at any rate, they begin to place blockading vessels around the various ports of the Confederate coastline. And you can see that uh, depicted in this cartoon, those little ships that go along the Anaconda's body. And one of the most important ports that they are going to blockade is right where I am now in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Now the Union had control of the Gosport Navy Yard at the beginning of the war. And at the Gosport Navy Yard were several important blockading vet or what would become blockading vessels and also facilities for building and repairing ships. And by April 20th, it became clear to the commander of this um, naval yard that the Confederates were going to be able to capture it. He did not know that Gideon Wells had reinforcements on their way to try to help him save some of the ships that were there. And so he got out the ships that he could, but he then decided to abandon the Navy Yard and to set it on fire. Some people think it was because he was incompetent. Some think it was because he may have been drunk at the time. Some thought maybe he was disloyal. For whatever reason he did it, he set the yard on fire. And he actually didn't do a very good job of setting it on fire because even though he hoped to destroy much of the yard, when the Confederates took over, they were able to salvage a lot of the buildings and the munitions and even one of the ships. Now, one of the ships that they salvaged was the USS Merrimack. The Merrimack was not an old vessel at this point. She had been commissioned in the mid 1850s and she had steam and sail power. Now, she was sunk in the Elizabeth River at the Gosport Navy Yard in Portsmouth. And so when, when the, the place was set on fire, everything above the waterline burned, but everything below the waterline was preserved. So her hull was preserved and the mechanical workings inside were badly damaged, but they were also preserved. And the Virginians who took over the Navy Yard decided that they would salvage this ship. And they wanted to develop a new vessel that would be able to be used to break the Union blockade in Hampton Roads. And so they hired a local company, a salvage company known as the Baker Brothers to pull the, the hull of the Merrimack out of the Elizabeth River and put her into dry dock. 
And then they began the process of building an ironclad casemate above the burned out hull of the Virginia, and they turned her into the Merrimack. And so if you look at this image here, this is what the conversion process ultimately accomplished. And that was an ironclad vessel of war um, with a case made over the top with slanted walls so that artillery fire would not be as effective and with a complement of 10 guns. Now the Union found out very quickly what the Confederate plan was, that they were in the process of converting the Merrimack into what would become known as the CSS Virginia. And so they decided that they needed an ironclad vessel of their own. I should point out ironclad vessels were not new at this time. In Korea, they had had an ironclad vessel going back to about the 1500s. By the time the American Civil War comes around, France has an ironclad vessel. England has an ironclad vessel and is working on a second one. So this isn't a new idea, but the what's going on during the American Civil War is going to change the pace by which nations are creating ironclad vessels. And so that happens for the Union. When Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, finds out that the Confederates are building this ironclad vessel, he decides that the Union needs one as well. And they didn't have anyone working on one at the time, for the Navy at least. And so they came up with the best plan they could think of to try to get word out to get an ironclad vessel. They put an ad in the newspapers. And so this is the ad that appeared in the New York Times in 1861. And it appeared in about two dozen newspapers throughout the North. And hopefully you can see it there. It says ironclad steam vessels. And now that now is gonna be the pitch, what the Navy wants. The Navy Department will receive offers from parties who are able to execute work of this kind and who are engaged in it, of which they will furnish evidence with their offer for the construction of one or more ironclad steam vessels of war. And I always think it's kind of funny to read that because they say we want people who are engaged in this work, but there aren't a whole lot of Americans who are engaged in this work at this point in 1861. But at any rate, they put this ad out and I won't read you more of the ad, but if, if you look at it or if you have the book, you can see it in there. The ad goes on to talk about needing two masts and rigging and wire rope. They're still thinking about the age of sail. They have not yet fully contemplated the changes in technology that are going to be taking place and how ship technology is gonna be seeing some drastic changes during the American Civil War. Well, Gideon Wells puts this ad out in August of 1861, and he begin, he creates an ironclad board made up of three old fogey sailors who are to then look at the proposals that come in and decide which ones to offer contracts to. They get, I think, about 17 proposals, 16 or 17 proposals, and they decide to make offers on a few of them. One was to a man named Cornelius Bushnell, who had a plan for a vessel that would ultimately be called the Galena. And Bushnell was a little uncertain about certain aspects of his ship. And so he went to a very famous inventor in New York City named John Erickson. And he wanted to talk to Erickson about some problems that he envisioned with the Galena and get Erickson's advice. And during that conversation, Erickson told Bushnell about a plan that he had had for an ironclad vessel. And you can see this on the left here. This drawing is from the National Archives. This was a plan that Erickson came up with in 1854 for an ironclad vessel that he actually tried to sell to Napoleon III during the Crimean War. And Napoleon III was not interested in it, but Erickson had this tucked away. And when Bushnell came to him in the early or late summer of 1861, Erickson told him about this design and Bushnell thought this is a great design. And he actually gets Erickson's permission to take it to Washington, D.C. Now, the ironclad board did not think very highly of Erickson because he had had some, um, let's say, things that didn't go great with the Navy in decades before the Civil War. And so they didn't want to do anything, have anything to do with Erickson or his design. But Lincoln saw this and Lincoln said, this reminds me of what the girl said when she put her foot in the stocking. I think it strikes me there's something in it. And if Lincoln, who loved technology and who after all is commander in chief of the Union armies and navies, says there's something in it, then the Navy's gonna go forward with it. And Wells was able to get things to work out so that the ironclad board approved of Erickson's plan. 
Now, there were a couple things about it, though. Erickson told them that he could build it quickly. He also said he could build it relatively inexpensively, only $275,000. But the Navy put into the contract some very interesting uh, provisions. One was it talked about masts and rigging and so forth. Even though they saw the design, they should have known better. Erickson ignored all of that. Second provision was that Erickson had only 100 days to build this vessel. And the third provision, and this is an important one, if you're the investor and if you're the designer and inventor, Erickson would not get paid for this vessel until she had proved herself in battle. And so Erickson loved to say after the war that when the Monitor went into the fight at the Battle of Hampton Roads, that she was a privately owned vessel and that he owned her. Now, he made some improvements over the design from the original one in 1854 that he sent to Napoleon III to what he ultimately gave to the Navy. And these are the, the designs that he worked from, the blueprints of the monitor that he actually built. And he changed that cupola, that sort of glob or that globular um, piece in the middle that looked sort of like a cupola into a revolving gun turret. And so you can see a cross section of it on the bottom of your screen there. It had two 11 inch Dahlgren guns in it. And then on the top of the screen, you can see a cross section from the other side and then a top down view. And the ingenious aspect of this design is that the monitor can now be facing in any direction and the turret can be turned to fire in the direction of the enemy. In the olden days, and even with the Virginia, you would have a whole lot of guns on the side of your vessel. You would pull up next to the ship next to you, and you would give them a broadside. And the problem there is you're as vulnerable to your enemy as your enemy is to you. It leads to very high casualties, a lot of destruction. In this case, the monitor can go in different angles and aim the gun or the guns and fire at the enemy and be in a much safer position. So Ericsson has 100 days to build this ship. And I'll just show you here, this is on the left-hand side of this slide is the pasteboard model that Ericsson made. This is maybe the one that Lincoln held. And then on the right is a painting of Ericsson with his model. If you ever go to the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC, which is the old patent office building, both of these are on display. The model is actually owned by the Mariner's Museum here, and it's on loan up there at the Portrait Gallery, but you can see these artifacts in Washington, DC. And here's an up-close image of the, um, of the pasteboard model. Well, Erickson contracts with um, firms all over the North, from Baltimore up into upstate New York to build different pieces of the monitor. And he it finally launches on January 30th, 1862. The first time she launches into the East River outside of New York City, there are some problems with the steering mechanism and she bounces from side to side and reporters are there watching this thinking this is Erickson's folly. There's no way that this vessel is going to succeed in fighting against the Confederates. They, there were naval officers who wanted to do a whole lot of work and redo things on the monitor and Erickson said, no, give me three days and I can get this fixed. And true to his word, Erickson did. And so by early March, 1862, the monitor is on her way to Hampton Roads. Now, while all this is going on, the Virginia is being completed and being armed with, with men and on March 8th, 1862, she makes her maiden voyage up the Elizabeth River. If you look at this map, which is from the Philadelphia Inquirer, at the very bottom right, you can see the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, Virginia, and just beneath Port Portsmouth is the Gosport Navy Yard. So the, the Virginia is going to head up the Elizabeth River to find the Union blockading vessels, these wooden vessels um, in Hampton Roads, and try to take them out. The first vessel, this was her maiden voyage and the men on board the Virginia did not know that they were going into combat. They were not told until they were already um, under steam on their way into the fight, what was going to happen. The first ship she attacks is the USS Cumberland, a, a vessel that had spent time around the world in the Mediterranean and also off the African coast participating in the Africa Squadron. And she, the Virginia rams the Cumberland, inflicts hundreds of casualties on board, men 
are killed at their guns. They jump overboard trying to uh, swim to shore and save their lives. She eventually sinks into the sea and uh, it's an utter, dev utterly devastating defeat for the Union Navy. The Virginia next turns to the Congress. Now the Congress resists for about an hour, but the, con the commander of the Congress had seen what happened to the Cumberland and after some combat decides to surrender. The commander of the Virginia, Franklin Buchanan was actually relieved. Buchanan was a Marylander. In fact, Buchanan sent Lincoln a resignation from the Navy in 1861 saying, I've got to go with the Confederacy. He just expected Maryland to secede. Then Maryland, surprised, didn't secede. And Buchanan wrote back to Lincoln or to the Lincoln administration and said, actually, can I have my commission back? And the Lincoln administration said no. So he went on and joined the Confederacy. He's the commander of the Virginia, but he has a brother who is the paymaster aboard the Congress. And Franklin Buchanan is actually relieved when the Congress surrenders because he knows his brother is on that other ship. And so hopefully his brother's life has been spared in this fight. Buchanan comes aboard the, the, the deck of the Virginia and he's overseeing things and soldiers along the shoreline begin firing on the white flag of the surrender scene. And in fact, I believe they were from the 10th Indiana. I might be wrong about the number. They were Indiana troops and I think they were from the 10th Indiana. They fire on the surrender scene and Buchanan is enraged that these Indianans are firing. And so he calls for a rifle from down below to be passed up to him. And he begins firing back at the Union soldiers on the shoreline. It was nothing more than I suppose a symbolic gesture. He's not gonna wound any of them, but one of them found, one of their bullets found him in the leg and wounded him and he had to be taken down below. But in the process of this, he orders the Cumberland to be set on fire and destroyed. Now, if you come here to Hampton Roads, you can still see aspects of this fight from the first day of the Battle of Hampton Roads. And this is a Google map in the middle of the map, you can see a bridge tunnel that's known as the Monitor Merrimack Bridge Tunnel. On the right hand side, you see the Congress wreck site. There's really nothing left there because the Congress was set on fire and burned throughout the night, actually, until a little after midnight, the fire reached her powder magazine and she exploded. But there are there is a little bit left at the Cumberland wreck site, which you can see on the left hand side of the map. And I'll show you a couple images of what the, the Cumberland site looks like. This is um, one, and then here's another image of the Cumberland wreck site. Over the last 160 years, this wreck site has really disappeared. There's not much of it left. And for years and years and years, watermen would go to this wreck site and pillage off of it, and they would find pieces of metal, and they would actually take it back and then melt it down and turn it into little collectibles, and you could, go by Civil War Times, mag I don't know if Civil War Times Illustrated had it, but Civil War magazines, and you would see advertisements for collectibles that were made down from melted artifacts from the wreck site of the Cumberland. The problem is that this is Navy property. And so not only were they pillaging a grave site of Union sailors, but they were also stealing Navy property. And eventually the FBI got involved and people went to jail over this. And so one thing I always tell people is if you wanna go see the wreck site of the Cumberland, make sure you have a police escort that's taking you there. Because if you don't have an escort with you when you arrive, you're certain to have a police escort when you're leaving. Now the Monitor arrived the night of March 8th, 1862. A novelist couldn't have come up with a better story. I mean, you have these two ironclad vessels being built hundreds of miles apart, and the first one goes into combat on March 8th, and the, the next one gets there later that day, just one day too late. The Monitor arrives that night as the men uh, look out and survey the ground or the the water, they see the Cumberland burning in the distance. When the Cumberland explodes after midnight, they, they see what looks like incredible fireworks. And um, they feel the rumble of that explosion for miles around. The commander of the monitor pulls up next to the USS Minnesota and they decide what should we do? And they decide that the best thing to do is to protect the USS Minnesota 
That was the third ship that the Virginia wanted to attack on March 8th, but the tide was receding and the Virginia was unable to attack her on March 8th. So that night, the boys on the monitor get very little sleep. They wake up the next morning at, at sunrise and around 8 a.m., they see the Virginia steaming back into Hampton Roads. And for the first time in the history of the world, ironclad vessel will fight ironclad vessel. And that is the real significance of this fight that there have been ironclads in the past, but they have never faced one another in combat. The Monitor and the Virginia fight for four and a half hours and ultimately it's a draw. And I'll show that the one image I was just showing is the most famous image. Uh, this is a painting at the Union League of Philadelphia that I really love. And um, they fight to a draw. The, both sides are gonna claim victory in this fight. In reality, it was a tie, um, but the real significance of this fight is that the leaders of nations around the world realize that their wooden walled navies are now a thing of the past and they're going to need to change the way that they create their navies. Now, the men of the Monitor fought in this battle and it was their first experience on an ironclad vessel and they didn't know what to expect at first. That, you know, some of them joked that they were on an iron coffin and that this ship would become a coffin for all of them. They didn't know if the turret would withstand the, the fire of the Merrimack. They didn't know if they would sink. And so you can almost use your imagination and, and think about what it would have been like to been, be a gunner in the turret on that day of March 9th, 1862, when that first Confederate shell strikes the outside of the turret and the noise must have been so loud. And then you look around and you realize we're all okay, and they, they go on to fight. Shortly after the battle, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, a man named Gustava Fox, uh, goes aboard the Monitor, and he didn't know what to expect either. He went on board the Monitor, and he thought he would see lots of blood and gore and a long casualty list, and instead he found the men sitting around enjoying dinner. And I'll read you a little bit of the book. So Fox goes on board. And he says, he sees the officers having what he called, quote, a merry party, enjoying some good beefsteak, green peas, etc. Surprised, he exclaimed, well, gentlemen, you don't look as though you were just through one of the greatest naval conflicts on record. And one of the officers said in jest, no, sir, we haven't done much fighting, merely drilling, drilling the men at the guns a little. Another mem other members of the crew joked that one of their fellow sailors who they called an old deaf salt said innocently during the battle, whereabouts the fight was going on. In other words, you could be inside this ship and, and not even really know what was happening. The men of the monitor understood that something significant had happened in the experience of what it meant to be a sailor. The paymaster on the monitor was a man named William Keeler. And William Keeler wrote a series of letters. They were published in the 1970s. They're, it's an incredible book. If you've not seen it, it's, it's worth having in your collection. And Keeler wrote to his wife shortly before the battle and he assured her, he said, your better half would be in no more danger from rebel compliments than if he was seated with you back at home. And he continued by saying, there isn't even enough danger to give us any glory. Thick, heavy plates of, and bars of iron on all sides, above and below, with two of the largest columbiads in the tower, meaning in the turret. And he said, I and then after the battle, he said this, I experienced a peculiar sensation. I do not think it was fear, but it was different from anything I ever knew. We were enclosed in what we supposed to be an impenetrable armor. We knew that a powerful foe was about to meet us, Ours was an untried experiment and our enemy's first fire might make it a coffin for us all. But then he said this, I think we get more credit for the mere fight than we deserve. Anyone could fight behind wooden wall, uh, sorry, anyone could fight behind an impenetrable armor. Many have fought as well behind wooden walls or behind none, and, none at all. And if you think about the experience of the Civil War, he's talking about glory. When we think about the men who charge across an open field in Gettysburg at Pickett's, Pickett's Charge, 
those men had glory. They had a risk. They sacrificed a great deal. William Keeler struggled with it, that he didn't feel he was experiencing that. He didn't know that he deserved glory because there was no danger in the fight. And there were others who read about the battle who felt similarly. There was a woman named Elizabeth Blair Lee who was living in Washington, D.C., and her husband was a sailor on a, a wooden vessel. And she was angry that men on board the Cumberland didn't get the credit that she thought they deserved. She wrote this to her husband shortly after the battle. She said, I am disgusted that the officers and crew of the Monitor should be so noticed when those of the Cumberland are unmentioned. These were more exposed to danger, did their part nobly, and would have done it successfully had the government done their part at all. In other words, let's not give credit to the Monitor boys who fight in a safe vessel, give credit to the men on wooden ships. The great writers of this era also began to notice the change taking place. Nathaniel Hawthorne visited the Monitor in October of 1862, and he wrote a very long essay in the Atlantic Monthly about his experiences in Washington, D.C., called um, uh, war uh, chiefly about war matters. It's really worth seeing if you've never seen it. And Hawthorne wrote about going on what he called the rat trap. And this is what he said. All the pomp and splendor of naval warfare are gone by. He said the monitor signaled a sea change that would breed, quote, a race of engine men and smoke blackened cannoneers who will hammer away at their enemies under the direction of a single pair of eyes. Saddest of all, he said, heroism will become a quality of very minor importance. In other words, what the men have done is not heroic. It's not like a classic sailor. One other poem, Herman Melville wrote a poem, uh, he wrote a whole book of poetry called um, Battle Pieces and Aspects of the War, published in 1866. And in this, he has a poem called A Utilitarian View of the Monitor's Fight. And Melville said this, yet this was battle and intense, beyond the strife of fleets heroic, deadlier, closer, calm mid storm. No passion, all went on by crank, pivot and screw and calculations of caloric. Melville ended by saying, war shall yet be, but warriors are now but operatives. In other words, warriors are like factory workers. Sailors who fight in these vessels are now no different from factory workers. Well, the, the sailors of the monitor, and here's the commander, I, I won't tell his story now, but I, I will come back to it later during the Q&A if you'd like. Um, the sailors of the Monitor had been part of a massive change in naval warfare. This is a political cartoon. You can actually see the original right over my shoulder there on my wall. Um, this is a political cartoon from a French magazine. I bought this on eBay right before the book went to press, so I was able to get it into the book. And uh, it shows a Mexican figure pulling at John Bull's coattails, trying to get his attention. And John Bull, who represents England, basically says, God damn it, leave me alone. I need to monitor what's going on over there. And if you look past his um, field glass, you can see that he's seeing an ironclad vessel in the distance. Now, just because the monitor was successful doesn't mean that people in the North weren't alarmed by what the Virginia had done. And inventors began sending ideas to Abraham Lincoln for things that they thought Lincoln should buy or that the Navy should buy to fight against the Virginia. And so I'll show you a couple of the inventions that came in. Some of them came up with new artillery shells. The one on the top here, you know, this guy had an idea, we're gonna put a new uh, cannon on the front of the Virginia or on the monitor, we're gonna pull up right next to the Virginia and hopefully she'll sit there and not fight back and we'll just fire right down and blast through the, um, through the casemate. The one on the left here, the guy thought, well, iron is a very hard metal and lead is a softer metal. So we'll make a spiked iron shell and we'll surround it in soft lead. And when it gets fired, the lead will kind of smush out of the way and we'll pierce the casemate of the Virginia with those iron spikes. The one at the bottom just looks like a cigarette butt being flicked over at the Virginia. I have no idea what's going on there. This one is a new shell that someone in quote unquote invented. And I do use the word invention lightly when I say it talking about these things. 
this one's not notable except for the fact that the the inventor drew a nice image of the first day of the battle in here. Some people had ideas for grappling hooks. The the one on the top, I think you would go and grapple the bottom of the the hull of the Virginia. I don't know what you were supposed to do once you grabbed her, but at least you could grab her that way. The one on the bottom of this image, you would sort of lasso over. And then I think when you reel it in, the idea was to tip over the Virginia. And I don't think that inventor thought about just how heavy the Virginia was. Some of them had ideas uh, for, this one is sort of like the jaws of death. Remember the whole of the Virginia is wood. So this guy thinks we're gonna latch on and puncture the bottom of the Virginia with a spiked claw. Here's another lasso. This one has a, a what we today would call a grenade that would be thrown on the end. And then here's another one with a, a, an explosive, what in their day they called torpedoes. And so this one has a floating torpedo. And the idea is the monitor is just gonna very casually do, 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 go right across the water in front of the Virginia with the hope that the sailors aboard the Virginia have no idea what she's doing and they run into the line and trip the explosive and boom goes the Virginia. Again, a lot of these people must've thought the, the Confederates were just oblivious. Some people again thought they could puncture the, the hull of the Virginia. So here's two or three plans for trying to puncture a hole in the Virginia's hull. Here's another one. Um, I like this one because I think that the inventor ran out of room on his paper. And so he just has the, the Merrimack or the Virginia going vertical. She's going down already as this uh, thing protruding out of the, the monitor is hitting her. This one I like, it's a retractable saw. It's kind of interesting because you figure, again, the hull is wood, but I don't know if the person who invented this had any experience with, with ships, because of course a saw needs to be able to go back and forth rather quickly to work. And it's kind of hard to make a ship do that. This one, the guy thought, let's get, get a big vessel with a lot of scrap metal on it. And we're gonna dump it on top of the Virginia and it'll be so much weight that she'll sink. Again, she'll have to just sit there and take it for this to work. Some people took the best ideas out of the monitor and the Virginia and created new ships. So this one has a casemate in the middle like the Virginia and then two turrets on the front and the back of the ship. And what this inventor didn't think about is that the bow and the stern guns are gonna take out your turrets. This one came from someone in Manhattan, actually, who had seen ships take out the docks in Manhattan. And um, so his idea was, we're gonna make a very sleek vessel with an iron nose, and we're gonna aim her at the Virginia. We're gonna put all, we're gonna get the fires going. She's gonna start going, and then all the sailors are gonna jump out and the vessel will just ram into the Virginia and sink her. I have to say, it's nice to talk to an Indiana audience. Even though I can't see any of you, most of the times that I talk about this, I'm here in Virginia. And as a Yankee, I'm a little embarrassed by all of these inventions that Northerners were sending to Lincoln. So, you know, I, I look at my Virginia audiences and I say, I look at them and I can tell they're thinking, how on earth did we lose this war if this is what the Yankees were coming up with? This was a, an invention, I, this one's called the Tormentor. I can't remember how this one worked, but I think it cost a half million dollars and the, the inventor said it'll destroy the Virginia in 15 minutes. Here's another one, a big ship that, it looks to me like this just has com, some paddles coming out and it's gonna spank the, the Merrimack into submission. And then they had it, more ideas for explosives. And so here are some spar torpedoes that ultimately would be used to some success um, in Charleston, as many of you are probably aware. And then underwater cannons. This one is a huge drawing at the National Archives. And I remember unfolding it and getting to take this photograph of it for the book and uh, an underwater cannon that someone came up with. And when you look at these underwater cannons, you get the sense on the one hand, these are very forward thinking people that, you know, they don't quite know how it's gonna work, but they have a sense that inventions might change. Uh, and ultimately in the 21st century, we will have torpedoes that um, will work underwater. But the technology here, like a, a hanging cannon by a chain, that's probably not gonna cut it. And I feel bad for the guy in yellow at the top right here because he's going down with that ship, that's for sure. And then I think this is the last one of these inventions that I have. Um, 
with a platform, a, a battery of, of mortars underwater. I don't know who has to hold their breath and go out and light those things, but these are the inventions coming to Lincoln. And in case you were curious, Lincoln did not order any of these. I mentioned a moment ago, Lincoln did visit the Monitor in May of 1862, and that was during the capture of Norfolk. I won't talk about that now for the sake of time, um, but I'd love to talk about it during the Q&A if any of you have questions. And he visited again in July of 1862, and a photographer was there that day, but the photographer sadly did not get any pictures of Lincoln. But I, I will show you a couple images. I showed one earlier, and this is another one showing the officers. You can see the dents on the turret there from fighting the Confederates. And then here's another image of the sailors aboard the, the deck of the monitor. These are young men who are doing what young men do. They're reading letters and newspapers, smoking cigars and pipes, playing games, uh, posing for a photograph. And this is the commander of the monitor in July of 1862, a man named William Jeffers, who the men hated, and they would not pose with him. And some people believe that he had the second chair out, hoping that Lincoln would pose with him, but Lincoln and the photographer didn't overlap. Now, the monitor sank on New Year's Eve, 1862. And uh, although she sank, her life lived on. And I'll spend just a couple of minutes telling you about how the monitor's legacy survives the Civil War years. Um, and actually, before I do that, I'll show you just a couple of the artifacts that have been recovered. And if you come to Newport News, you can see these artifacts here at the Mariner's Museum. Here's the monitor signal lantern. And then this is believed to be the steering wheel of the CSS Virginia. And at the Mariner's Museum, they have a life-size um, reconstruction of the monitor that you can walk out onto. And there, there it is from a distance. And then they're preserving the Dahlgren guns of the monitor and then also the turret. And so here's the turret upside down under conservation. Uh, if you, again, if you've never been here, come to Newport News and, and check it out. Well, the monitor sank New Year's Eve, 1862. And the monitor had been appearing in advertisement since two days after the battle. And that did not cease after the sinking of the monitor. This is an advertisement from the Hartford Current, which is still a newspaper today. And you can see the language here. The monitor sunk, but the ship of state still floats down the river of time. And Ford and Bartlett in a small boat are coming too, with a few thousand dozen hoop skirts attached. Specimens to be seen at Weatherby's and Company. Sample dozens sent at the lowest cash wholesale prices and all orders promptly filled by Ford and Bartlett. So even though men, 16 men have drowned on the monitor, advertisers are going to use her to uh, sell their wares. We have an entire chapter in the book on the monitor and popular culture. The monitor could be used to tell morality tales. And here's a children's Christian magazine where the front page, again, I have, this is in the book. I bought this on eBay. The front page story tells the story of the Battle of Hampton Roads. And the monitor is like the righteous David with his sling. And the Virginia is like the evil Goliath. And if you want to be a good child, you will be like David. You will be like the monitor. You could dance to the monitor. You've got three images here of song sheets that were published. You could dance to polkas and the grand march of the monitor or oh, give us a navy of iron. You could go see models of the monitor. And these appeared in cities throughout the North. And in fact, we found evidence of one as far away as Paris. The one in Paris, if I recall correctly, was the model of the monitor for sale in a shop had little monkeys manning her. And this is a photograph of the Pittsburgh Sanitary Fair in 1864. And if you look carefully in the back of this image, you can see all these young boys who have come to pay, they paid a quarter a piece to see this monitor and that money raised thousands of dollars for this, the Army, uh, Union Army. You could see the monitor in parades and the monitor still shows up in parades at times. Here's a veteran in a GAR with a GAR badge on his chest. He's sitting in the turret of a monitor float. Here's an 1890s image of sailors in um, Brooklyn, New York, where the monitor was put together in Greenpoint and they have a float of the monitor behind them. You could find the monitor in the strangest places. How about the International Order of the Longfellow, or of the Odd Fellows? You get a, a, a ashtray with the monitor featured on it. 
You could buy products featuring the monitor and advertisements throughout the North featured the monitor. So here's a McCormick Reaper advertisement. Now, the thing I love about this, as well as a lot of other prints from the era, is they combine the two days of the battle. So you've got the Cumberland sinking on the left, you've got the Congress in the back, and then in the middle, uh, in the foreground, you have the monitor fighting the Virginia. So you want to have a lot of action in these prints. So you get two for one, March 8th and 9th. But if you're a farmer and you want to buy a product for your farm, like a McCormick Reaper, what better to sell you that Reaper than the monitor? Because the monitor was a strong, durable vessel, just like the McCormick Reaper. If you're a woman working in the kitchen and you need good, durable pots and pans, you're going to want to buy ironclad enameled ironware. And here's this wonderful image of the monitor with a historically inaccurate turret because the guns are facing outward. That's not what they were like on the real thing, shooting all these pots and pans. And ironclad enameled ware made a lot of these different postcards um, featuring their work. Again, if you're a woman and you want a durable sewing machine, why not buy the little monitor sewing machine? And what better to sell this concept to a woman than a picture of a woman with her little monitor invincible sewing machine right above the Battle of Hampton Roads? This is from the 1890s as well. If you're working in the kitchen, you might want monitor flour. And we found so many products that featured the monitor from tobacco, I'll tell you about alcohol and some others in, in a moment. This is one that someone sent me actually after I gave a talk at the Virginia Historical Society. A man said, hey, when I was a kid in the 60s, my dad and I made a little race car out of the, and we made it look like the monitor. So he sent me this picture and I, I put it in my slideshow. You like to smoke? You can get Will cigarettes with a tobacco card featuring the monitor and the Virginia. You don't like to smoke, but you need something to give you that extra oomph in the morning. How about McLaughlin's coffee? Get a trade card for that. Coffee isn't going to be strong enough for some of you. And so maybe you need the monitor blend pure rye whiskey. And you'll notice here that right below the battle scene, it says this excellent product of the still has medicinal and tonic virtues. True, true statement as far as I know. In the 1940s, you could buy gin. America, uh, Seagram's Gin. And uh, if you look over my shoulder there, this very image is hanging there. At CNU, we are not a dry campus. We are a moist campus. And that means that students are not allowed to drink on, on campus, but faculty can. And so I've got a Seagram's Gin ad hanging in my office here. Um, the cool thing about this one is it shows you the reconciliation that had taken place between the North and the South by the early 20th century. Because whereas most of the early ads just featured the monitor fighting the Virginia and the monitor is the focus, here you've got two vessels that are American originals. And so Seagram's is really trying to appeal to Northern and Southern consumers. In Hampton Roads, Virginia, there's a local brewery called Uzelfinch. It's a microbrewery. And the owner is a friend of mine, and he wanted all of the beers originally to have some connection to the history of the fort. And so he invented a beer, uh, developed a beer called Short Fuse, and it's named after a, the steward from the Monitor a guy named Lawrence Murray, who was known for getting drunk. And at one point, uh, he got he got chained up for getting drunk on a couple of occasions. And the last time, right off of Fort Monroe, he fell overboard and drowned. His body wasn't recovered for a couple of days. And um, so they developed this beer called Short Fuse. And in fact, here in Hampton Roads, we also have um, ironclad bourbon, which I highly recommend. And if you peel open the label, they've got the blueprint of the monitor, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, so the monitor has inspired all of these different products over the years. The monitor has ap uh, appeared in movies and an ironclad first appeared in a silent film called the Confederate ironclad in 1912. The monitor appeared in a 1930s film called hearts and bondage, which is not historically accurate. I'll tell you that also a 1990s made for TV film called ironclads, which is much more accurate, but the love story isn't. In fact, some of you may remember the Monitor and the Merrimack appearing in an episode of Gilligan's Island. So the Monitor has been everywhere in American popular culture. And I'm gonna close by just reading you 
the last few sentences of the chapter on the monitor in popular culture. And this is from the book, which I highly commend. If one indulged too much in these monitor brews or suffered from other ailments, Dr. Rayvon Pierce's pleasant pellets were sure to be as effective as the monitor in curing a whole host of ailments. In an advertisement that circulated in the 1890s and that featured the monitor and the tagline, small but effective, Dr. Pierce promised that his pills were, quote, effective in conquering the enemy, disease. Whether a person was grumpy, thick-headed, and take a gloomy view of life, or suffered from sick headache, bilious headache, constipation, indigestion, bilious attacks, and all other derangements of the liver, stomach, and bowels. Dr. Pierce's pellets would clear up your system and start your liver into healthful ac action, effective, just like that little monitor that met the Merrimack in Hampton Roads. So with that, I've probably gone a little bit over, I apologize. Um, but I would love to take any questions you all might have. And I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen there so that I'm a little bit bigger. Thanks, John, very much. Always appreciate your talk. And I, and I will, I will um, just follow up on something John said. I have my copy of the book, and it's a fantastic book. And I, and I will say, beyond just the content, which is great, and a lot of the stuff John presented today is in here, it's, it's a beautiful book. It, it's the... the the quality of the publication is fantastic. It's sort of the shiny pages, the 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 illustrations or the images come out fantastic. It's, it's an absolutely wonderful book. Yeah, I was so pleased with how Kent State did it. They did an amazing job with it. That was great. We have some questions here lined up. I'll kind of start with there. So we saw on several of the different images you showed, um, they talk about the monitor versus the Merrimack, but it, it became the Virginia. So mm -hmm. do you have a preference as to what you refer to the Merrimack slash Virginia? Yeah, it, so um, the official name, she was rechristened the CSS Virginia, but she was so widely known as the, as the Merrimack that even sailors aboard the Virginia called her the Merrimack and Union sailors certainly did. Mm. I used to use it in, interchangeably. I try now to do more of... Um, using the name CSS Virginia, but it's hard being here in Hampton Roads. I showed you that Google map of the Monitor Merrimack Bridge. So, you yeah. know, you say to a friend, hey, I'll, are you going across the Monitor Merrimack Bridge? It kind of gets ingrained in your mind to say Merrimack. So I, I try to say Virginia, but I, I sometimes do both. I think, you know, growing up, I'd never even heard of the CSS Virginia. <laughs> I'd always heard of the Monitor and the Merrimack. And I never heard about it until I, I studied more about the Civil War and learned that it had actually even been rechristened, which I thought was was just kind of funny. Yeah. So the next question, um, Battle of Hampton Roads. Do you have any idea how many people were watching from the shore during that? During yeah, that, it's a great uh, question. Um, the Hampton Roads essentially is a naval warfare amphitheater. And so I've seen some estimates, I think, for 20,000 people had gathered mm. to to watch it. One of the one of the cool things about the book is that the first half of the book tells is a narrative history of the war uh, of the the monitor, sorry, of the monitor. And then the second half of the book are primary sources that we found that have not previously appeared in print in their entirety. Some have been quoted, but most are all new to readers of uh, Civil War naval history. And so we included, I think we have one account of someone who traveled some distance to be able to watch the second day. People knew that there was something significant going on. And some of them were soldiers. There were Union and Confederate soldiers on the opposite shorelines, but then a lot of civilians came out to watch the battle as well. And yeah, the one number that comes to mind that I've seen somewhere is 20,000. Now, who knows if that's really accurate because you just, you can't know. Um, some people I'll point out were afraid of it. And we, we write about this one man in here who was a union soldier who was court-martialed for cowardice because when the Virginia came out, he ran away and hid. And um, he, in his trial, he said, well, I did it because there were women who were afraid and I was trying to get them away from the fighting. 
Um, but the court wasn't buying it. I think he was convicted of, of running away in the face of the enemy. Yes, how noble of him, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, I'll say this. You mentioned, and I'm grateful for it, you mentioned earlier the different books I've done. One of the, none of my books are on the same kind of topic. Like, I, I've written about a lot of different things. And so that court martial case, I came across because I was doing research on court martial trials for a totally different project. And then you come across this guy who's court martialed facing the Virginia, and um, it, we Anna and I were able to bring in aspects of the story that other people didn't have in other histories of the battle. And especially with Anna, my co-author, as the creator of the Monitor Center, she was in charge of the conservation effort for over a decade and knew no she knows that vessel better than anyone else in the world. Very good. Next next question. There's actually a couple of questions here related to you had several photographs of um, uh, people on the deck of the monitor. So mm -hmm. I'll ask a couple a couple questions. I'll, I'll say them, and if you need me to remind you what they are. Sure. First of all, um, there appeared to be an umbrella over the monitor's turret that was an add-on. Add what was its purpose? And then the second question with respect to, to those deck photos. In, in the first photo you showed, there was an, it looked to be an African-American mm -hmm. um, sailor there. And, and, and the, the, curious, the question is related to were there uh, African-American sailors, obviously this was earlier in the war, mm -hmm. that were participating in the Navy prior to the infantry groups? Yeah, great question. So the add-on for the turret, yes, it had a canvas cover that could go on the turret or be taken off. And I think it was just to offer shade when, when the monitor was not in the fight and the men were above decks. Mm -hmm. During the summer of 1862, the monitor was on patrol on the James River, about a mile, the James River is about a half mile that way from my where I am and you know it, Virginia summers are miserable and according to some records it got up to 165 degrees in the galleys below decks now the men could not always go above decks because there were confederate confederates on forts and on the shoreline who were happy to take shots at them but when they could go above deck they would want shade and so I think that's all that was was to offer shade there were other parts of the monitor that were also removable so um there was uh, now I'm blanking on it, but there was some there was something related to the smokestack. Oh yeah, they could they could extend the size of the smokestack um, for when the monitor was making longer voyages, uh, so that water wouldn't go in. But then they could take that down um, when um, when she went into battle, so that it wasn't a target. And the second part of that question. Oh, right. African-American African yes. American sailor. Yeah. The Navy was integrated before the Civil War. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of the aspects of American history. African-American men fought in the American Revolution. They fought under Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. When the Civil War comes around, African-American men are not allowed in the army. And they had, they volunteered in fairly significant numbers in 1861. And the Lincoln administration says no. But the Navy was actually integrated before the Civil War began. Now, that's not to say African Americans had great positions. I mean, they're in the lowest positions and um, not treated particularly well, but they could join the Navy. And my sense is part of that is probably because Black men had a very important role in uh, the merchant marine world you know they're they're sailing on whaling vessels and and other merchant ships out of new bedford massachusetts and other new england towns and so i think there was sort of a natural fit for black men to serve in the navy there were several black men who served aboard the monitor that one on that in that particular photo very well may be a slave a former slave named saya carter saya carter was from a plantation just up the river from here he joined the crew of the monitor after the battle of hampton roads he escaped from his plantation jumped into the james river swam over said hey i'm you know this is who i am and i want to get away from my owner and the sailors of the monitor took him in there was also um there was also there were black men aboard the other vessels as well i'm I'm writing a book that'll come out in February, February 12th, 2022. So mark your calendars. Mm. It's a it's a history of black visitors to the Lincoln White House. And as part of that research, I've been reading the the weekly Anglo-African, which is a, a New York newspaper published uh, by a black editor. 
and it was owned by African Americans. And um, I read through the entire year 1863 recently, and then I'm, I'm now halfway through 1864. And last week, while doing this reading, I came across a poem called something like "The Black Sailor of the Cumberland." And so it's a it's a poem that got published a year after the battle about a black sailor who fought on that vessel. Yeah, fascinating. I think that's a, that seems to be something that we that we or the public doesn't realize as much. We always think about glory in that movie and the integration of the infantry, but but the involvement that uh, um, that African Americans really did play, even militarily earlier on. Yeah. The next one uh, that I have here is uh, one of our our viewers' comments that he has been to the Mariners Museum and he's curious about um, when the guns and turrets will be finished with conservation. If you have any. Any thoughts on that? The last I heard was about another decade. And I heard that about a year ago. So probably nine, 10 years. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a very slow, painstaking process where those um, artifacts are in a solution. The image of the turret that I showed you guys is not one that I took. I used to use one that I took that showed the turret, but it was covered in water and you couldn't see it really. Every two, every, I think it's twice a year, they drain the, tur the turret's tank and do some work on it without any liquid in there. And um, so that the photograph I showed is from then. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be about another 10 years. And what they hope to do then, the turret's upside down, they hope to turn it right side up. And then they have an exhibit space where they are slowly putting the pieces of the monitor in place. And it's actually right inside of the building next to that life-size reconstruction of the monitor. And so their hope is to eventually move the turret to where it would have been in that reconstruction space. They, they have the propeller there already. They've got some other pieces in place, but it's very slow work. And, then, and that there's a follow-up question there too that I think fits right in at that time. Um, th th there was, the question was asked, how thick is the turret wall? Mm. It's got eight pieces, or I should say, it's in it's cut in slabs, sheets, I should say. Each one is one inch thick, and then they're riveted together around the turret, and then at any given place, it's eight thick, so it's eight inches thick. Very good. Um, we had another one of our, 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 uh, our viewers say uh, he had read that crew members in the turret became deaf and were bleeding from their ears during during um, during their time on the monitor. Is that true? And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I I do think that is true about some of them bleeding from their ears and temporarily deaf, not permanently deaf. Um, but I think that the noise in that moment or for that four hours was um, something that caused temporary deafness. The the commander of the monitor also was temporarily blinded during the battle. He was in the pilot house and there was just a very small slit that he could look out of to try to command the ship from. And the Virginia stern gun hit him at point blank range and temporarily blinded him there. And um, Erickson realized that putting the pilot house where it was was not the best idea in part because it was right in front of the turret and, in, and it was also separate from the turret so that he couldn't get his commands to the men inside of the turret. So these guys in the turret are not only facing all this noise, but as they're being ordered to fire, they don't really know what direction they're, they're facing or where the enemy is. And so the paymaster of the monitor um, was running back and forth underneath the turret to the pilot house, relaying messages back and forth and relaying orders. Um, so there was a lot of commotion that those 19 men in the turret were facing during the battle. Absolutely. We have another one here that says, um, as we know, the monitors weren't entirely invulnerable, um, but it remained a successful design into the 20th century mm -hmm. as shore protection in many navies. Um, and, he, and that question is, did Erickson profit from his patents from all the monitor building during and after the Civil War? You know, that's a great question. Um, and I got that question about two years ago about how much money did Erickson make or did he become a really wealthy man in the aftermath of this? And I honestly don't recall um, how much he made off of it. The, so the contract was for this particular vessel, 275,000. And then he subcontracted with a lot of people and he had investors who were making money off of that. 
and I don't recall how much he made off of that initial contract, but I do know the Navy ordered many more ironclad vessels. And I and it's somewhere between, I've seen different numbers. It's somewhere between the low 60s and the low 80s for how many were ordered. It might be that 80 some were ordered and maybe 60 some were built. And a lot of them were built off of the monitor design or some uh, aspect of the monitor design. Um, and the, the deal that Erickson worked out was that the, the pay structure, the investment structure that he did with his fellow investors for the original monitor was the same one that he would, that they would do for all subsequent orders. And so my, I don't know how much money he made, but my hunch would be, he probably did okay with it. Good and for I, him. I, I'll throw out one other thing. There was a man named Theodore Ruggles Timby who also had developed and actually patented a revolving turret design and um, there ended up being some legal conflicts over that issue. And some people say Erickson stole the design. I don't think he did. Um, but Erickson did pay a royalty to Tinby uh, for each monitor that was produced. So uh, there were a lot of people profiting from these ships. Oh, definitely. Um, you had mentioned about Lincoln going and visiting um, the monitor. Can you just elaborate just a little bit about his visit? Obviously, Lincoln was somebody who was very interested in technology, being the only president to he himself hold a patent. Right. Um, and that was something he definitely looked at um, through the war effort was advancements in technology. So uh, can you talk a little bit about Lincoln's visit? Sure. So Lincoln was very upset that the Union had not captured Norfolk. And uh, part of the reasoning is that as long as Norfolk was in, in Confederate hands, the Virginia had a port, a safe haven to go to. And so finally, in early May 1862, Lincoln decides that he's going to go down to Fort Monroe, which was is on the Virginia Peninsula and had remained in Union hands the whole time. And he's going to personally orchestrate an attack on Norfolk. And so um, I think it's around May 5th, 1862, he heads down to hear from Washington. He's got Secretary of the Treasury, Sam and Chase. He has Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, and a few other people come down. And Lincoln actually goes out onto the water. He goes to um, what had been basically Andrew Jackson's Camp David, which is known as Fort Wool. And then he scouts out where he wants to have a landing site on the coast of the southern side of Hampton Roads. And he actually comes under fire at that point. So a lot of times people say that the first time that a president was under fire was Lincoln at Fort Stevens in July of 1864, but it's really actually in Hampton Roads in May of 1862. And so Lincoln goes back to um, Fort, Fort Monroe and General Wool is there and he basically says, you guys gotta go attack. And so Wool takes um, a couple thousand men and they, they go across and they land on, on the south side of the water and they go to Norfolk. And what happens there is the mayor of Norfolk stages an elaborate surrender ceremony where they turn over the keys of the city to the Union soldiers who are, who are capturing the city. And what the Union didn't realize was this was all just a, a ploy to slow down the Union advance so that the Confederates could get out with everything they wanted. And at that point, the Union has now control now has control of the south side of Hampton Roads. The Virginia doesn't have a safe harbor anymore. And so at five in the morning, the, the next day, the Confederates blow her up. And um, again, just like the explosion of the Congress, people can feel that explosion for miles around. Those who saw it said it was like an incredible pyrotechnic display. And um, Interestingly enough, artifacts from the Virginia float onto the shoreline and former slaves go and gather the wood and the metal and things and use them to for things that they needed in their homes. So there's kind of a weird irony of the Merrimack starts as a Union vessel, is uh, destroyed by the Union Army, is captured by the Confederates, is destroyed by the Confederates, and then is uh, pieces of her are recaptured by uh, loyal unionists in the in Virginia and used for their own purposes. Uh, it, it's such a fascinating story and, and there, I think there's a lot more to it than 
than we might, the, the, certainly that I ever learned in school. And I know I learned a lot about it uh, from your book and, and hearing your talk as well. Um, that looks like the, that's the last question we had here. Is there anything else, John, you wanted to hit on real quick as we wrap up here? No, that, I, this is great. Thank you so much for having me. It's been, I, I wish this could have been in person, but maybe we can do that at some point. Yeah, that would be fun to have, have another time where we can bring you out here. Um, and, and, I, and, I'm, and knowing that you have 12 books or 10 and 10, two more coming and probably lots more after that too, I'm sure there will be ample opportunity that's right. Right. Number 13 will be in February. In so yeah. <laughs> Very good. With that, I think we'll wrap up tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And, and especially thanks to our speaker, Dr. John White. Thank you all. And I hope to see you next time.